Uh, good morning, my name is Hannah Sinner and my candidate session number is 030013-0028. Um, my purpose of this IOP topic is to discuss the development of some of the main characters in the Green Mile. I plan to do this by analyzing qualities that the characters obtain and show how they change and progress by the end of the novel. Uh, for my creative piece, I took photographs that represent the different characters. Uh, my rationale, I took photographs that represented the characterization of Paul Edgecombe, Percy Wetmore, and John Poppy. Uh, the photos express different moods depending on the type of character they're representing. So, for example, Paul's represented a conflict of decision, re uh, Percy's represented an internal unraveling, and John's photo conveyed his journey and how it will soon be coming to an end. Uh, I used objects and scenes in nature to convey these symbols. Um, the characters I'll be analyzing are Paul Edgecombe, Percy Wetmore, and John Coffey. Uh, Paul will be the first one that I analyze. So about Paul. This slide shows the aspects that I will be focusing on. So these are the ones <coughs> at the beginning, how he's physically in pain and how he's seeking redemption. And by the end of the novel, he becomes emotionally in pain and he um, reaches that morally um, peace, moral peace. So Paul in pain. Um, at the beginning of the novel, Paul is in constant pain because he has a urinary um, infection. And um, he comments on it regularly. And we can see this. Um, he comments on it regularly to, uh, to express the intensity of his pain. And um, we can see this in these examples because um, he comments on it. And you can see how it, um, the two comments are only four pages apart. So that supports how he comments <coughs> so often. Um, the pain goes away. Um, he's relieved when Paul, when John, um, when John um, heals him in part three of the novel. Um, this is explaining how Coffey urged him into his cell. He says that he just wanted to help him, and it was urgent that he needed to see him. Um, Paul described the feeling of relief as being a jolt slammed through him and a big painless whack of nothing, of something, and then it was gone. So. His physical pain from the beginning transforms into emotional pain. By the end of this novel, Paul is now emotionally and morally pain due to the fact that he realizes that John is in fact innocent. He becomes very troubled when he finds this out because he does not feel that he can do anything to change his outcome. He feels he'll still have to walk the mile. He thinks this because nobody, he doesn't believe anybody will understand him when he says he found out he was innocent because he performed a miracle on himself. Um, at this point, he also realizes that not all executions are black and white, some are indeed gray, because yes, John is walking a mile, but he is in fact innocent. Um, seeking redemption. Um, I feel like Paul re seeks redemption after Dell's execution because it went so horribly, and Paul was the one who appointed Percy to be out front for his execution so that he could get him to go to Briar Ridge and leave um, the e block. And then he realized that the execution was going to go into a downward spiral, spiral once he realized the sponge was dry, but he did not realize until it was too late. Um, this is discussing when he made the decision. Um, this excerpt was from when Paul was talking to Hal Morse and letting Percy, um, discussing about letting him be out front for the, de um, the execution. Paul knows that it's very risky, and he chooses to do it anyway for his own benefit. So this kind of shows the crossroads. Um, he figures Dell will die either way, so why not just let Percy do it? And then um, it says right here, it's like, all right, I said standing up, I'll put him out in front, so he's um, decided. And then this is the realization of, of when um, he realized Dell's execution went wrong. Um, he realized there was no water running down from Dell's cheeks. <coughs> And then he was going to scream, but he said if Percy had given him five more seconds, he could have, but he realized too late. Um, on the road to moral peace. Um, in my opinion, Paul sets out to save Melinda Morris through John Coffey to rid himself of the guilt that he still harbors from Dell's execution. Uh, I feel like Paul wants so badly for John to be able to perform this miracle so that he can be morally at peace with himself. Uh, the way I see it, I think Paul thought he could reach peace by saving a life because he took a life and he wants to give one back. Um, this is the first photo I took. 
um, for Paul. I chose to take this photograph because it represented the crossroads that he was facing while putting Percy, um, whether he should put him out for Dell's execution or not. Um, he knows it's risky, like I mentioned, and however he chooses to take that risk. Um, he even stated, I'd tweak the devil's nose, so he's toying with it. And on this side, you can see that the clouds are somewhat darker, and then you can also see like the dead tree that represents like a death type, and then the sun is coming in on this side showing the other brighter path. Uh, now I'll be discussing Percy Wetmore. Um, about Percy. So when analyzing Percy, I will focus on the topics of his authority and his outer appearance, which can, um, such as his hair, which can be directly tied to his control. <coughs> uh, Percy's authority. Uh, Percy actually got his job on e through his connections with the governor. He constantly hides behind his connections and threatens the other guards with the authority um, of those he is connected with. Percy feels that he is better than everyone else, and he walks around with a sort of like arrogance about him. Uh, this is the evidence. The first bullet point is an example of how Percy talks back to Paul, showing that he thinks he is above him. Um, Paul ordered him to go over to the infirmary, and Percy declined and said that they got all the men that they need, but he eventually went. Um, the second bullet is an example of when Percy makes um, calls into his connections, how called per, uh, Paul into his office to say that he did get a call from the state capitol that morning complaining about him. Um, what authority? Paul, um, Percy's work weak and unarmed from his safety barriers because there's no one there to help him. Paul and Brutus don't care that he is related to the governor at this point. They corner Percy and force him into the restraint room anyway. Um, they're also very disgusted with Percy when Paul is taking him over. He's like, please don't put me in there with him because he's comparing Paul and Brutal to what he would have done if he was in their position. Um, these are the examples. These show how Percy's authority means nothing at this point in time to Brutus and Paul. He is getting manhandled and nobody is there to help him. Percy's exterior. Um, Percy appears tough and collected on the outside, but really he's um, unraveling. One example is that his hair is always perfectly combed and groomed. And in my opinion, this is a form of like control. His hair is always um, perfectly groomed when he is in control of the situation. And then on the flip side, his unraveling. The audience really begins to see Percy fall apart once he is being forced into the restraint room. He enters and then he comes out a different person. He's more wild and like untamed. Um, he is belittled and disheveled. His hair is in a complete disarray, which symbolizes his lack of control, because he can no longer control the situation. Um, these are examples of Percy slipping farther and farther away from being in control. Um, and, the, and then, so it says, the color was fading out of Percy's face a little by then, but his cheeks were still flushed, and his hair was usually swept back and gleaming with brilliant time, and tumbled over, had tumbled over his forehead, so it shows the difference. And then, he also is shocked when Paul... Um, smacks him in the face. He doesn't know how to react. Uh, this is the photo I chose for Percy. Um, I chose to represent this photo for Percy because it's an old worn down shack and I feel like this shack is unraveling just as Percy is unraveling. I view him at, like as the shack so how I mentioned Percy's hair like coming down and getting all crazy. Also the roof is like decaying away and like unraveling and opening up. And then it's just very worn down and uncapped, just as like throughout the novel, as he goes mentally insane, he loses himself. Um, now I'll be talking about John Coffey. Um, as I was analyzing John Coffey, I realized that he maintained the same persona throughout the whole novel, in my opinion. Um, he continued to be gentle and wanted to help others. Um, and I think by him not completely changing like the other characters, it allowed the other characters, such as Paul, grow as a person and actually develop as a character. So John kind of served as like a constant on e -block that others can be compared to. Um, gentle John. One of the things that was so surprising about John was his gentleness because of his size. Um, all of the guards and prisoners were taken aback by his size, and, but even more about how gentle and caring he was. Um, one of the most surprising things, John asked Paul if he, had, if he kept on a light after bedtime. Because it threw him off 
being a man who supposedly killed two people and he was scared of the dark. Uh, the other thing that surprised Paul was his handshake. It was immensely gentle. <coughs> and then these are the specific um, excerpts concerning the light after bedtime and then also the gentleness of when they shook hands. Uh, the healing hands. John seemed to be the happiest when he was helping others. Uh, he would keep to himself and often weep uh, when he would often weep until there was an opportunity of when he could save somebody. Um, the time before they went to go save Melinda Morris is the most the most obvious example that jumps out to me, um, because he was ready and waiting instead of weeping like he usually would be. So right here is the example of it. It says John Coffey, who would usually have been lying down at his at this time, long thick legs dangling and face to the wall, was sitting on the end of his bunk with his hands clasped, watching Bruto with an alertness, a thereness that wasn't typical of him. He wasn't leaking around the eyes either. And then this is the photo I chose to take to interpret um, John Coffey. Um, I decided to shoot this because it symbolizes his journey. Uh, before he was found, we don't know how long he traveled, but I imagine that he helped many people before the, um, he got caught. And then I choose to um, photograph it at this angle because um, you can see how the train tracks, they start kind of wide and then they eventually go until they narrow into like a nothingness. And it symbolizes how the closer he gets to his execution, the shorter his life is, so it's pinching off. And that is my presentation.